You all ready? Are you sure? Okay, we're going to have a great time this afternoon talking about something that's incredibly important to all of us. And we're going to do it a little bit different today. First of all, I'm Frank Ski, and I will be your host today for the Voices Against Violence. And this is something that affects all of us in here, every one of us in here. It's a concern not only of you, the students and young people, but also for our standpoint, the adults. Like it or not, youth violence exists in communities across the country. And indeed, right here in the city of Atlanta and right here in DeKalb County, where we are now. And as a father, I've got to tell everybody, I'm concerned about it because it's important to me and my children. And it's important to you and your children, your siblings, your cousin, and your family. And what we want to do here today is we want to talk about that. Now, we're not going to talk to you. We want to talk with you, okay? So we're going to do it a little bit different today. First of all, I got to say hello to actor Dwayne Boyd, who's in the audience. How you doing, my friend? Good to see you, man. All right. So today, here's what we're going to do that's going to be a little bit different. We want to hear from you. So get your thoughts together because we want to hear what you have to say. It's going to be a two-way exchange today. We want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your comments. We want to give you our ideas and our comments because none of us have all of the answers. But collectively today, we can come up with some great solutions, okay? We want to know the conditions that led to the death of Dominique Boyer two weeks ago in DeKalb County. Or Bobby Tillman almost three years ago here in our neighboring county of Douglas County. We want to talk about the causes, the loss of life that is going on in our community, the teenagers. We want to know from you all how you feel about this. And to keep us on task today, here's what we have. We have two co-hosts from our DeKalb County Youth Commission, which are going to be down here, our co-host, and they are going to have a microphone on both sides. So when you have something to say, you raise your hand. We'll make sure you get the microphone so we can do this together. All right, so these are my partners right here, okay? Now, you're gonna be my co-host for the day. You're gonna each have a microphone where you'll be out in the audience and you'll be able to pass it to these people. We wanna hear from the young people, okay? All right, so the rule is if you see a young person with their hand raised and you see an older person next to them, go to the young person first, <laughs> okay? Because we know we old people, we could talk about it all day long, but we wanna hear from the young people, okay? Also. Um, why this is exciting today. We want to take a look, if we can, real quick, to one of the recent incidents of violence in our community. Presented by DCTV, here's a special, The Dominique Boyer Story. As the warm Georgia air ushers in the new spring season, students at DeKalb County's Columbia High School and schools across the country ready themselves to start the next chapter of their lives, beginning with the academic rites of passage, graduation. I appreciate everybody, all help that I have gotten from everybody out here for my son right now. Thank everybody who came out here for him. Instead of readying herself to watch her oldest son of four walk across the stage, donning his cap and gown, this grief-stricken DeKalb County mother and her family have just prepared her son, 18-year-old Dominique Boyer, to receive guests for a different type of gathering, his funeral. His body is ready for a view. Anybody want to go see his body for a view? A little more than a month before Dominique was set to graduate high school and go on to college where he planned to study accounting, he was shot and killed while hanging out with friends at this Glenwood apartment complex in late March, one typical afternoon following the school day. And what I know and I will miss about Dominique is his love and smile, his comfort, his dreads, and was shaking just saying, okay, auntie, all right, auntie, I'm going to do it, auntie. Never any disrespect, never any cursing, just nothing negative that I can say about my loving nephew, only as I feel like that his life was taken too soon. 
gone too soon is becoming a more commonly used phrase in communities across the country. In fact, youth violence is the second leading cause of death for young people between the ages of 15 and 24, resulting in an average of 13 deaths a day in 2010 and nearly 2,000 medically treated physical assaults in 2011. According to DeKalb County Police, this was also the case in the untimely death of Dominique Boyer. As late as yesterday, April 1st, uh, a 16-year-old male was arrested in connection with this shooting. He is and has been charged with murder. Investigators believe the quiet, smart boy with the million-dollar smile was not the intended target. Our investigation has indicated that this is between two different gangs that are rivals and going back and forth at each other. Um, unfortunately, when one gang wants to get back at another gang, they'll do it in a way where they may not target the specific person. Nine times out of 10, they hit somebody else. As this community gathers to remember the short life of Dominique Boyer. No more suffering, no more pain. He out of here, right. but Amen. he gonna watch over his family while he goes. Thank you. Amen. 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 Yet another family has to suffer and accept the painful finality of youth violence. I would like the first thing to thank God for coming out here. That's right. I can't decide. As for youth offenders who oftentimes feel invincible, Detective McQuilkin warns. If a child were to tell me that can't happen to me, I, my reaction to them would be, okay, next week, I'll probably be looking at you down there if you keep up what you're doing. Or I'll be talking to you in an interview room and then taking you to jail, one of the two. And as thousands, like the Boyers, are forced to face the harsh reality of youth violence each year, communities are desperately seeking answers. Answers law enforcement officials say can really start from within the community. Uh, out of tragedy uh, comes an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to advance. I want to remind each and every one of us that violent acts can occur anywhere at any time, but it's through the, the, the power that is within each of us that we can overcome the violence. We can say it has to stop now, it has to stop today, and we can move forward. As this community begins the unbearable process of healing from the loss of young life, a flickering flame of hope begins with the acceptance of individual responsibility and accountability for one's fellow man. We got to show a lot of love, lean on each other and love one another, put the guns down, nothing love, fight. The yep. guns, if you got guns, you a coward, you, behind, yep. you fight behind ammunition. But they we do not need People that. Not we got to love one another. We are joined also by a couple special guests that are out here in the audience with you. Joining us today is the family of Dominique Boyer. Would you please stand? And as you just saw, youth violence can be very, very deadly. It is not a joke. Um, people's lives have been affected and their lives will continue to be affected for the rest of their lives, as you can see, the family that is with us today. We'd just like to say thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Be seated. We are gonna bring our panelists up, and then we're gonna open the floor for you all to make some comments. So we ready? Before we do that, we're gonna take a quick break as we bring our panelists out, all right? Thank you. In the state of Georgia from 2000 through 2010, 1,088 children and teens died as a result of gun violence. Right here in DeKalb County, we have experienced some tragic events involving young people falling victim to senseless violence. We cannot accept living in a state of fear, especially for our children. As concerned citizens, we have to take a stand and work together to protect our greatest asset, the young people we love. Today is an important step toward educating our youth, engaging thought leaders, 
and empowering all people to stand up and speak out. Guess what? There's nothing wrong with peer pressure. It's the negative peer pressure that has, has really caused many of our schools to be negatively harmed uh, by, uh, by the pressure that is being exerted by your peers. So I'm asking you all today, as you leave this place, uh, exert that positive peer pressure. If your boys, your girls, your homies are not doing the right thing, you know what? You don't have time for them right now because your future is too important. It's too valuable. Uh, uh, to your family and for your own life uh, to be a part of things that are negative, especially youth violence. Welcome back to Voices Against Violence. I'd like to introduce another special person who has been working tirelessly in this subject of youth violence and anti-bullying. Monique Rivardi, how are you? Stand up, that is Bobby Tillman's mom. <laughs> According to a recent national survey, 19% of the murders in the United States were committed by kids under the age of 18. We're focusing on that issue today and why youth violence has spread vastly across the United States. We're joined by an esteemed group of panelists to help us tackle this issue. DeKalb County's new Chief of Police, Dr. Shedrick Alexander. Chief Alexander was sworn in April 1st. Prior to that, Chief Alexander was Federal Security Director for the Transportation Security Administration. Please, a warm round of applause. We're also joined by Solicitor General for DeKalb County, Sherry Boston. She serves and oversees the prosecution of criminal misdemeanor offenses filed in the state court of DeKalb County. Approximately 13,000 cases a year. A round of applause for Solicitor General Sherry Boston. Next up, Cornelius J.E. Lloyd, the Savannah native who earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology. Please welcome Minister Lloyd for our participation this afternoon. Also with us today, the Honorable Judge Desiree Sutton Pleger. She is a native of Alabama. She made history at her high school by becoming the first African-American to graduate valedictorian of the senior class. Please welcome Judge Pleger here with us today. And finally, we have our youth representative, India Westbrook. India is a DeKalb County native raised by a single mother. She's a graduate of Redan High School, where she was a straight A student, yes. Member of many clubs and more uh, right now. She's also participating in the Summer Youth Employment Program, India Westbrook. You may be seated. And again, let me remind everybody, we wanna hear from you. So we will begin by asking some questions, and then we would like for you to ask some questions or give your comments. And I'd like to start off by this one question. For any of our panelists, do you think the youth violence that we've been seeing recently is an increase or is it pretty much the same? Anyone's opinion? Well, um, I personally think, well, I can't really say it's an increase because I wasn't born back then, but um, I can say that I do see an increase in my community. Um, I, I guess because it's from peer pressure from the um, other kids at the schools and it also comes from home as well. So I feel that if everybody can just come together, we can actually see a decrease in people's personalities and students' personalities as well as the parents as well because they see that they have better control in the schools as well as at home. Anyone else? Well, well, let me say this. I haven't been in community long enough to really know it's been a real increase or decrease in terms of youth violence uh, throughout DeKalb County, but I can say this is pretty much consistent with youth violence that we see across the country. And that in and of itself creates a real problem and uh, suggests to all of us, I think, that we have something of 
epidemic proportion that is going on that we really need to talk about and find solutions to. Okay. And for our audience members that are here, they're going to be asking questions. Judge, tell us how this affects your daily life and what you do in the court system. Well, at the juvenile court level, uh, we handle incidents that involve perpetrators who have, in most instances, not yet reached the age of 17. We get cases from the community. Uh, we get cases from the school system. And we get cases from within the home where there is domestic violence. Once a case gets to the juvenile court, that means that an incident has already occurred. And then it is our responsibility uh, as juvenile justice professionals to then try to correct the behavior, rehabilitate the youth who has committed the violent act, and then also ensure that the victims who have been involved in the incident also uh, get redress. And Sherry Boston, tell us, have you seen the age of the youth offenders getting younger or older or staying the same? Well, we are definitely in my office and we are dealing with misdemeanors. We're seeing um, the ages of offenders and victims getting uh, smaller and smaller. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we are committed to focusing on the issue of teen violence, um, teen dating violence, and youth violence, and targeting uh, young children to talk about this issue because um, this does not discriminate. There's mm -hmm. not an age where you flip a switch and you are more uh, able to become a victim. As we can see, there are victims at every age, and we have to do what we can to stop it um, as soon as possible. Minister Lloyd, you have the ability to counsel young people. And, and they come to you and they open up. That's correct. Um, what have you been seeing? What are, what are they saying that's the constant thread amongst all the youth you've been talking to? Um, well, if we look back at the statistic that was listed at the end of the Dominique Boyer story, um, it's not just a story, but it's uh, becoming a lifestyle that we're used to seeing. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated was that it's not just an external that we see happening, but there's something happening internally with our young people. And so when we spend time with the young people, we, they will open up. And so we have to create uh, opportunities for real conversation um, even in how we address our population. I really appreciate the format for today is wanting to hear from our young people. And so what I'm noticing is that there's a lot of anger. We see that this violence is an outward sign of an inner, inner struggle, inner turmoil that has gone on in our communities. And it's not something that's just happening. You asked the question earlier if this was something that we uh, see happening um, and in increase, but it's something that's consistent, has been happening for the past 30 years. Um, so my entire life, life Time. We've been talking about violence in our communities and the implications of that and what's going to happen. And so I, I hope today that we can have real dialogue, but also some action items for what happens after today. You know, I remember, and, and I want to open up the floor, so if you have a question or you'd like to make a comment, just raise your hand. I remember it wasn't that long ago um, when I was this age, uh, maybe a little bit longer than I'd like to admit, but I do remember. As, as you all do when you were in school. The difference that I see is not that we didn't have kids that fought. It's not that we didn't have um, bullying, not to the extent that we have it now. But what we didn't have was the anger. We had gangs we wanted to be a part of. It was fun. We would get into mischief. You know, sometimes we'd have, you know, beefs between other people, but we didn't have the level of anger that I see so many young people have today, where they are really mad. I remember several of the um, uh, times we tackled this subject um, on V103, when we brought young people in, we would hear that the bullying was to release frustration on somebody, somebody innocent, that had nothing to do with why my day was bad. But again, these are young people. 
expressing adult violence amongst themselves. Somebody tell me, why are young people so mad today? As a student at the DeKalb County High School, I know that there's a lot of desensitization to, to violence. And people see violence like in classes or on television and they laugh and they don't see it as something that's terrible. And then people turn around and use that same thing against each other. And it's like a buildup of things that may be going on at home or maybe they're struggling in school and they turn that towards other people. So I feel like one thing that we could do in our schools is teach conflict resolution, like teach how to release things without hurting other people, whether it's verbally or physically. Thank you very much. Anybody else? You know, when, and, and I wanna, um, I guess, ask this one of our police chief. When you get a call that there has been a form of youth violence and you go to the home, what do you see in the home? Well, that's, uh, so, so, so let's take a scenario, if you will. Let's okay. be a little bit more specific and take a scenario where a police officer have to re re respond to uh, a resident where maybe a parent is calling that their child is acting out, they're breaking things, they're fighting with them. And this is not unusual, by the way. Uh, and officers respond to the scene. And probably, if you were to talk to those responding officers, the first thing that they will tell you in their estimation, once they get the stories from both sides, both the parent, both the the uh, young person that was involved, that there has just been a total disconnect in communication between the parent and the child. And the parent may do a lot of talking, but very little listening. And the, the young person who, for whatever reason, uh, and we all come from different, very different places and have very different experiences, oftentimes young people want to be heard and understood. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes parents, many of them, some of them, not all of them, of course, uh, struggle to understand the challenges that a lot of these young people have to deal with the day that you and I, many years ago, did not have to contend with. And their reality in terms of what they're experiencing in their neighborhoods, at school, and even sometimes in their home is very different than you and I. And I think it becomes important. I think if we were to ask any of these young people in this audience, what do they want most from their parents? And for people who are responsible for their caretaking, it is to be heard and to be understood. Very good. You know, in thinking about that, and young people, you can help us out with this one too. We see that many times parents are calling. They're frustrated. They're asking for help. Now, we're, we're saying that young people are, are screaming out for help, but I can show you a bunch of parents who are like wanting to throw their hands up because they almost don't even have the ability to discipline. You know, you discipline too hard, your child services call you. I can't get a spanking like I used to get. I used to get whippings back in the day. <laughs> but, you know, and the whole neighborhood knew when I was getting a whipping because my dad opened the window for everybody to hear. <laughs> But nowadays, it's so hard for parents because, you know, the kids have so many rights in, in, their, in their kids, so it's a different space. But what type of resources does a parent have when they need help? You know, and, and I hear, I, I get letters, many of you all probably know, you know, that some parents are just trying the best they can and they don't have the resources. What, what do you do in that sense? I think you all have to seek out community help. So but prior to becoming a minister of the gospel, I also served as a program coordinator for an organization called Forever Family, working with young people um, who dealt with family members who may be involved in a criminal justice system. And it was wonderful because the uh, young people were reaching out for help, the parents were reaching out for help, the grandparents were reaching out for help, but they got the help that they needed. 
Um, it's interesting because it takes so much work to get people actively involved in programs like that, and we spend a lot of money um, to try to solve the problem after the, the problem's been noticed, right? So there's not a lot of funding available for programs that are trying to prevent this kind of behavior from happening. I, I, to piggyback, um, young people are crying out for help and crying out to be heard, and so we have to create the environments for them to be heard. And so you, you ask the question, why is everybody so angry? Well, it's, it's generations of anger. And so now we also see this anger being celebrated. The young lady mentioned that there's a desensitization that's going on with young people because I can, uh, there was something that we didn't have access to many years ago, and that's social media. Social media has changed the way that we see life. Reality TV has changed the way that we see life as well. Mm -hmm. And so we have the uh, celebration of violence that's going on. So the uh, more angry that I am, I can videotape that, put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and everybody will see it all at the same time. And then now I'm popular because I'm that person that you better not mess with. All right. And Frank, if I could talk about resources for parents. Sure. Um, I know that there's a fear. Parents don't want to pick up the phone and, and feel like they're turning their kids in or calling the police. But when I think about what Judge Piegler does at juvenile court and what we do in the solicitor's office and also what Chief Alexander does in the police department, we do more than just prosecute and put people in jail. Each of our organizations has victim witness advocates, resources, social workers, and programs that are meant to help parents and youth if there's a problem. So if, I, if my office gets a call and there's a parent that's having a problem, we are more than happy to link that person with the resources they need to get the help that they're asking for. We're just not here to put people in jail or to um, put a charge on you. Really what we want to do is help. So All reach right. out, don't be afraid to reach out to these types of law enforcement agencies and we can also connect you with those community organizations, those nonprofits, and also offer the resources that we have right at our own fingertips. All right, comment. My name is Trey Weaver. Um, I'm in DeKalb County, well, obviously. But to pick up, piggyback off of what they were saying is the parents at home also have to be involved with their children because if a child is confused in school or confused about something, then they try to talk to their parents about something, but their parents don't listen to them or don't understand them or can't help them mentally or don't know how to handle a situation, then the kid can get even more frustrated and handle it in a violent way. So that's what I was saying. All right. <laughs> Lee May. Thank you. Uh, and just um, the young man came up here and talked about um, speaking to your parents. But here's the reality. Um, some of your parents don't even know what to say to you. They don't know how to deal with the issues that, that, uh, that you're going through. And you have this built up frustration. You have this anger. You have this hurt. You have all these things going on in your mind and emotionally. And you just need somebody to talk to. And, and that's where additional resources, your parents may not even know um, who to direct, who to, who to ask to help you. So one thing I want to encourage you all, my wife is a uh, mental health therapist, she's a counselor. And she talks literally to you all most times out of the day, who just need to talk to somebody, who needs to be able to express what's going on internally, because a lot of times you have these emotions that are building up in you, you're just, you're mad. You don't even know why you're mad. You know, you want to hurt somebody. You don't even know why you want to hurt somebody. And you need somebody to talk to. So one thing I would suggest to you all is to, if you feel like you're at that moment, you know, try and talk to your parents. Um, but if they frankly ain't, ain't, ain't no help, and there's no, no, you know, there's no knock on them, tell them, can I go see a counselor? Can I go see a therapist, you know? And, and they may not even know where to send you to, but ask them could they research it for you. Now here's something else they also don't, probably won't know. If they have health insurance, and even if they don't, there are ways that, that it can be paid for. Because the one thing they may say is, well, we ain't got no money to do that. You know, uh, but there are resources out there. Number one is if they have health insurance, they, many times the counselors can go out 
uh, you can go to the counselors and your health insurance will pay for it and cover it. But you all have to be able to express what's going on with you. We got a brother over here that I just met, and he's going to speak just for a second, Brother Omar, uh, who has been uh, in the penal system. And I'm sure he's going to share real quick, not, not long, but real quick, his quick story. Um, but you need to see somebody who was on the other end of expressing that in a negative way, you know, and he's going to tell you what it got him. Again, real quick, but I want you to hear that because you need to see, you know, kind of the results of making some poor decisions and not being able to verbalize and communicate that in a way that is not, not harmful to you. We are going to take a quick television break and we'll be right back. Be engaged. Uh, don't look at this as a waste of time because this is not, this is valuable time because the information you receive today, you'll be able to take back to school next week and help save somebody because a lot of your classmates and people may not be coming back on Monday and it may be because of violence. I would challenge you today to think about doing that. What can you do in your sphere of influence to help alleviate violence? are back. Again, don't forget, I've got my co-hosts, Philip and Jasmine, in the audience with mics. And Brother Omar, we want to come back and hear a little bit of your story you wanted to tell us. Real briefly, uh, my name is Omar Howard. Um, I'm the founder of Freedom and Choice Incorporated, which is geared toward encouraging our youth to choose freedom over incarceration. Uh, real briefly, uh, I made some real bad decisions in my life, 89, 90, trying to get into the drugs, robbing, just my whole life went a totally direction, different direction. And what I did was, I was angry. I was angry because my mom couldn't afford the clothes that I wanted because I seen the peer pressure of all my other friends having Jordans and different clothes. And I wanted that same, you know, materialistic stuff. And I didn't realize that the choices I was making was going to turn my life totally in the wrong direction. I ended up doing 15 years in prison uh, for crimes I did and for crimes I didn't do because I tried to keep it real and didn't want to snitch, didn't want to tell. And in that process, man, I had 15 years of my life taken away, life that I can't give back. And in the process of that, somebody's life was taken because of some bad choices that I made. And what I want to encourage y'all young people now, and what I want to encourage your parents as well, first, you got to choose your friends wisely. You have to choose your friends wisely. You have to make, begin to make the right decisions, not just down the line, but every day of your life, you had to make the right decision. Because I promise you this, you go down in prison, you're going to realize the life that you have now is the best life that you can ever have in your life. And so I, what I want to encourage the parents is, and a lot of kids don't like when I say this, stay in your kids' business. You can't wait till they get a teenager once they begin to develop a life and their own personality. You have to start when they're young. And I realize the culture that's been built now, it's a culture of anger. You have to watch what they look at every day. Some of the stuff that we watch as adults and we let our kids come in there and watch, it, what it does is it, it, it teaches them how to be angry. Look at some of the reality shows that we look at. This is real life. You think it's just a reality show, but it's something that our kids see and it's teaching them anger. Music that we, you like, we allow our kids to listen to, that we promote sometimes, that we buy. It promotes anger. It pro promotes violence. It promotes drugs, guns. I did. I lived that life. I used to listen to music. It used to get me hyped. So I understand. You know, some music makes you dance a certain way. It, 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 can help, it can do that. So we have to be involved in our kids' life every day. And we can't be afraid to tell them what's right. So I just want to encourage y'all parents to, to be, be mindful of what your kid is doing. Be mindful. Be mindful. Um, and just encourage you with this. Choices that we make young people, if they're not the right decision, it can destroy your life forever. It can destroy your life forever. So I just want to encourage y'all with that. Thank you very much, Brother Omar. Psychiatrists will tell you that there are basic needs that every person has. There are basic needs that we need to have in our life. And we constantly will seek out those needs Originally, the needs are supposed to be given to us by our parents. But if our parents don't give it to us, then we go seek it from other people. 
One of the basic needs, of course, is to be loved. Everybody needs to know that somebody loves them. One of the most important needs that a person has that they need to have is a sense of security. A sense of knowing if I'm home, I'm safe. A sense to know that mom and dad always have my best interest at heart and they're making sure I'm safe. So I got a question for the young people. Young people, how many young people in here do not feel safe at school? Anybody? Raise your hand. You could be, you could be honest. If you don't feel safe at school all the time, raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to speak. Okay. How many, keep your hands up. How many of you all don't feel safe a lot in your own neighborhood? Raise your hand. Okay, so in saying that, how do we solve this problem? Because the sense and the need to have security is what draws a lot of these young people into connecting with the wrong type of people out of the sense of security. If I don't want to fight this group of people, I have to be cool with this group of people. If I don't want to get bullied or beat up, then I have to close my mouth and not snitch. If I want to be perceived as being cool, I've got to be loud and everything. How do we solve that problem from an adult standpoint? There's a question uh, oftentimes I ask, and I don't want to respond to this uh, when I ask it. <clears throat> in, in, you know, we think about basic fundamental needs, the hierarchy, uh, uh, that hierarchy, uh, which is food, water, safety, someone caring for you. But I've learned over the years, too, uh, that one question we often overlook when we talk to kids, how many of you really feel safe at home? And, uh, and I don't want a response to that question. I just ask in a rhetorical way. But I, th you know, I think one thing that we have to consider uh, even today and even going forward with this process, and particularly when we talk about communication, uh, is, is that we're gonna have to teach uh, and provide an environment to help many of, our, many of our parents to learn how to communicate with their children. And we can have all the programs in the world, uh, as you have heard here, but at some point, in, in, in what we're seeing is that programs are becoming so overwhelmed with a large number of people who need help, mm. young people, uh, that oftentimes it becomes very hard to sustain those programs with a lack of funding we know that's taking place across the country. So, but I think there's some really inexpensive and very basic fundamental things we can do, just like we're doing here today with these young folks, is also to do this with parents because we gotta teach them how to communicate. And Parents love their kids. All these kids out here, their parents love them. And they got them in here today because they made them be here today. And that's what a good parent does, or a guardian, or whomever may be responsible for them. But I think it's important, too, for us to think about how going forward we need to help parents to understand that sometimes our children don't even feel safe at home. All right. And that needs to be talked about. All right. All right. Now, don't forget, if you have a question, raise your hand. Because we'll, we'll definitely get the microphone to you, right here. Hi, my name's Demarcus Davis. I'm 17. Um, the question was posed, why are we so angry as teenagers? And I believe that it's not only anger, but sometimes it's also stress. And I'm now a senior in high school, but I know that I've seen a spike in the violence, mainly in part to what I believe is the budget cuts. After the budget cuts, many school after school programs were cut. So as teenagers, even though we may not like to admit it, we struggle for acceptance. Even as seniors, we're just trying to be accepted into a college. So my question is, what do we do? We no longer have, for many of us, we no longer have an outlet to go to after school, be it drama club, um, some football programs, music programs being cut. So what do we do? Because when we can't stay after school to be in a group of like-minded individuals, we have to go home and 
For many of us, it's having to deal with the stresses at home. Maybe there's not enough food this week, or maybe we don't have enough money. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. Very good. One of the other things that, um, and, and Judge, maybe you can help us out with this. One of the other things that we've been seeing in our community is a startling increase in young people with psychological issues um, at an alarming rate. Um, it's, it's one of those things where at first we didn't want to talk about it, now we talk about it. We have students that have uh, vast amounts of students with ADD, ADHD. Um, the autism spectrum goes so far now. Um, schizophrenia and other things. And our young people are not being diagnosed, so therefore they're not being helped. And when we hear about these students that do these types of violent things, especially in the mass shootings, then we find out later that they did have a psychological issue and nope, everybody tried to cover it up. What do we do? Because we have a lot of students who have these issues. And, and what happens? ADHD, ADD. So instead of us saying, well, we need to deal with this, we just label them as a bad student. Then bad students are not learning and getting kicked out of school, put in special schools, and we're just masking that problem over and over again. How have you all been dealing with it in the court system? Well, you have identified a critical factor uh, in what might be perceived as a surge in, in youth violence, and that is the mental health issues that have gone undiagnosed. Uh, we see it in our court, in fact, to address that particular problem with our female population, we've started a mental health court just for uh, teenage girls to address those issues. Many of them have had behavioral issues over the years, but no one has taken the time to refer them to get a diagnosis. Uh, and often, you have a parent who sees alarming behaviors at a very early age. I'm not talking a typical tantrum, but if you have, say, a three-year-old who really has an extreme temper tantrum every day, then that's not a routine terrible two, terrible three sort of thing. It's identifying it early and then knowing where to go to get that assistance. As someone mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily whether you have insurance or not insurance. There are many places that offer services irrespective uh, of your uh, ability to pay. So it's identifying it at home, it's identifying it at school, and then as a parent or guardian, not being afraid of getting that mental health diagnosis. Now that's just step one. Step two is your willingness to go ahead with the treatment plan. If there's medication that is prescribed, then don't be afraid to go ahead and give that child the medication that he or she needs. Now I don't mean to suggest that medicine is the answer to every mental health diagnosis. There are many uh, behavior modifications that can be put in place. But whatever the plan is, follow through. Uh, and if you are a youth who has been diagnosed, um, I know you don't want a diagnosis, but you have to be able to embrace it and understand it. That way you can know what your triggers are. And when there are flags, warning flags, then you know how to seek help short of engaging in violent behavior. So yes, mental health diagnoses, treatment, and follow through are very, very big factors in the, the incidents that we see that are referred to our court. All right. Comments? Yes, sir. My name is Charles Glover, and I just want to kind of piggyback on what the police chief said about, you know, getting the parents in here. You know, I work at an elementary school, and I see parents coming, dropping their kids off every morning with the head locked on the cell phone. That's just a good time for them to communicate with their kids. This is the last. And when they pick them up in the afternoon, same thing. No communication. And I think someone said that um, parents be busy, they don't have time. They don't have a choice. The kids didn't actually come here. You have to put time in your schedule so they can communicate and address their concerns. Because what I find out, if, they, if you don't address them, they go to their peers. And most of the time, their peers are having the same problem. So it's like, they can't help each other. And 
I'm not trying to promote the church that I attend, but the church that I attend, they have free counseling. My pastor would allow whoever need help to get help at the church that I attend. That's Beulah Baptist Church. And I think that we just gonna have to go back to family first. Television's off, radio's off. And I do that when I pick my grandson up. I turn the radio off. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what he has to say, and I have things I want to say to him. And that's the bottom line of most of the problem, non-communication. All right, thank you. <clears throat> we'll take one more comment over here. I want to collaborate on the diagnosis that they were talking about. When I was four years old, they diagnosed me with being special ed, and I find that, um, that that is not really a good way to determine what's wrong with children mm. because they diagnosed me as special ed. But now that I'm 16 years old, I'm an AP scholar, then I'm ranked number 15 in my class. So I don't think that's good. Amen. Hey, Ski, can I speak? Ski, can, yes. I, can I speak to that for a moment? And, and, and I'm gonna switch hats here. I'm gonna take the chief hat off and put on the clinical psychologist hat. What this young man is saying is very, very true, and I think we have to be very careful with diagnoses because when I was training uh, back in New York, and you know, one thing I found, because I've seen a lot of uh, these young, young folks that you're talking about, they appear to have attention deficit disorder, or they appear to be uh, special ed. And uh, there are certainly cases where they're you know, there are young people who, you, you know, who do have that type of diagnosis. But what I also learned, too, is that oftentimes, sometimes, not all the time, many of these kids have been diagnosed wrongly. It is not a, a, a medical diagnosis. It is more of a behavioral problem. And when some of these youngsters may come out of environments, and I'm just speaking wholly across the country, I'm not speaking specifically to anywhere, uh, but if you come out of an environment, if you come out of a community that is plagued with uh, violence or with drugs or with negativity or with uh, people not taking care of us the way that we should be taken care of, uh, what will happen oftentimes, negative behaviors will, will uh, become part of that child's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And they may appear to be uh, suffering with a mental health condition but it may not necessarily be that. But over time, if there is no intervention that uh, occurs, uh, they can develop a mental health condition. And the number one mental health condition in this country, and I see it all the time, and that is depression. And depression uh, reveals itself in a lot of ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're laying in bed and can't get up, don't want to eat, can't sleep, that kind of thing. It also comes out as anger as well, too. Uh, because a lot of what we see with a lot of a lot of people, young people and old people, a lot of this anger that is being uh, spewed is there is some depressive uh, uh, episodes that they're experiencing, but it just comes out very, very different. And, and what is anger? And I'm going to tell you what anger is in a very simple term. It is people who are hurt. That's what anger is is people who are hurt. So I, I just needed to share that, and I thank yes. this young man for having the courage to stand up and say that, because we all need to be conscious of it. But that is not to minimize uh, the whole idea that we do have people that do suffer with mental health conditions, so we don't want to minimize that at all. Okay. India, I, I wanted to ask you real quick um, before, because I want to get some comments from the Boyer family. I wanted to ask you real quick, in speaking to young people, you are at that age where you are old enough to be mature mm -hmm. and young enough still to be cool. What is it that you've seen hearing, talking to the young people that they will tell you that they might not tell us? Well, um, when I was in high school, I was surrounded by many people my age. And one thing that we do mention today is the lack of communication. Communication is the key to solving these issues that we have in our community. A lot of people that I know and known in high school and even in college today, they turn to other people, they turn to friends, they turn to people their own age because they can't turn to their own family. 
They can't, they don't have the communication skills. They don't, they don't feel like they're op they're, their relationship is open enough for them to talk to the people in their own homes. So they turn to other people, they turn to the gangs, they turn to the violence because that's where they feel like their love is. They feel like they're being loved by these people that really don't love them because the people in their own homes are not showing that affection towards them. So you have young kids in my generation turning to these gangs, feeling like that that's their new family when it's really not because they will turn on, you, turn on you in a quick second. So I feel like if the people in our homes can just step up, as well as the younger generation stepping up, letting them know how you feel. We have to let people know how you feel. You have to communicate, you have to tell them what's going on inside of you because people, we can't read minds. That's one thing we can't do, we can't read minds. So if you just build up the courage to actually talk to the people in your homes, I'm pretty sure that the violence in our community will diminish. All right. that's, that's the good way that we can start seeing a difference in our communities. All right. Can we hear from the Boyer family? Yes, I would just like to tell all of you guys, thank you for coming out and being here today. I know that you probably thought that this was going to be boring, but um, I work with the youth myself, and I see some students here from Miller Grove and Stone Mountain, and it's just a blessing. And um, basically, I just want to say that I've been bullied. I've dealt with being hurt, betrayed, jealousy, friends, all types of stuff. And um, basically, you have a voice for a reason. You are here for a reason. You are who you are for a reason. So fight for your life. Not literally, because we're nonviolent. But fight for your right. Let your voice be heard. Speak out. Seek help. Be you. Embrace you. Love you for who you are, don't try to be nobody else and don't follow anybody else's lead because you're an individual and you are here for a reason. And I thank you. Thank you. Okay, I wanna thank everyone for coming out. I wanna thank the community as well as Ms. Diamond Lewis, Frank Ski, all the parents, um, Ms. Tillman and everyone. Um, we all are grieving right now and it's, very, it's been very devastating the last couple of weeks um, for the tragedy of my nephew's loss. Um, my sister, my mom, we're all hurting. It can't be stopped, as they stated earlier, if you reach out, reach out to someone because you all, are, you all have values in your lives. So please just reach out and love on one another. Put the guns down. It's other ways that you guys can resolve any chaos besides violence. Don't be afraid to go and talk to anyone. Don't let anyone make you feel like, oh, you, you, you're, you're just going, I mean, don't make anybody intimidate you where you feel like you cannot go and speak to anyone about any situation. And once again, I wanna thank the community and thank everyone and you kids, you guys are some loving kids. Don't let anyone tell you differently and you stay strong and get your education and move forward in life because you are a blessing to this world. All right, amen for that. <clears throat> so everybody, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your participation. We've reached a special part of our show. And right now, you should all have one of these pledge cards right here. Everybody got one? This is all part of the 50 Days of Nonviolence put on by the King Center. And together, we are going to sign this pledge, and your pledge cards will be sent to the King Center directly. So we get to do that right here. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like everybody to go all the way down the pledge card, and at the bottom it says, Change Agent. And I want everybody in here who took your time to come in here today to let's just read this last line together. Is that okay? Can we do that? All right, we're gonna go all the way down to the bottom where it says change agent. And we're gonna start reading. Everybody out loud, okay? We're all in school now, here we go. I realize, right, that I am an advocate, that I am an advocate for positive change in my community. For positive change in my community. And I will abstain from violence and I will abstain from violence. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today in Voices Against Violence, a teen talk show taking a stand against youth violence. I have been your host, Frank Ski. 
Thank you and have a wonderful day and a round of applause again for our panelists. Thank you all.